Good evening all, and welcome. People come and go within our lives, friendships and relationships. But sometimes, these people can leave in rather drastic and horrifying ways for reasons that will scare us to the bone. I also need to add that Story 3 has a link to the writer's YouTube channel where they also explain further about the incident. If you are so inclined, it will be in the description. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. When I was a junior in high school, I was quite an odd kid. I liked having colorful hair, piercings, and all that kind of stuff. And the school I went to was near Atlanta, so there weren't many people like me. I tried to find friends that liked the same kind of music and other interests, and I could normally kind of brush off any weird energy that people put off. I ignored it. I just wanted friends. I was in gym one day hanging out with a group of weirdos, and there was a guy that I hadn't seen before. He was wearing a Guns N' Roses t-shirt and jeans that were like a size too small. His name was Ernest. We immediately clicked with each other, in a platonic way, because he laughed a lot and liked many of the same things. We started hanging out in gym together every day. People watching and making fun, people playing basketball. It wasn't too long until he started making fun of my appearance and making me feel terrible about myself. I had acne super bad in high school, and he joked saying that I had meth skin. Me being me though, I kept hanging out with him and eventually it led to hanging out after school. He would invite me over to his house and we only stayed in his room. He refused to let me meet his family. His parents didn't really speak English, but I still wanted to meet them. I always thought it was weird that Ernest didn't know Spanish, but his siblings did. And when, he could always speak words that sounded Russian. He pretty much only played It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia on TV and rammed about superheroes and would always come up with these strange scenarios where he was an evil villain and how much power he would have. Fast forward, I get a job at a pizza place. Ernest gets the same job at this pizza place, so inevitably we're working together now. He pretty much never lets me out of his grasp. It got to a point where he took me to school every day in his PT Cruiser, which I still get chills about when I see one of those shoe-shaped cars. We started skipping school a lot. I mean, we pretty much went to school about two or three times a week. And this is where things start to suck pretty bad. He started pressuring me to sleep with him and to do things of that nature. I didn't really want to get into details because it's quite disturbing, but he manipulated the situation in such a way that I felt like we were in a relationship because I thought I needed him. He really convinced me that we were a couple but I was so repulsed by him that I never could fully accept it. He started telling our other friends that he had slept with me and that we were in a relationship. I denied it all, and to this day I deny it. I've lied to my therapist, to my friends, but right now I'm admitting it. At one point he ended up living with me and my family in the same room as me. He had convinced my entire family that he was gay so that he could live with me. He literally dressed all up in pink, but a scarf around his neck and pranced around my aunt trying to win her over with his fake personality. I was so used to living in chaos that this was barely a problem for me. During all of this, he was such a rude piece of crap to me. I remember asking him for a ride one day and he said no for no good reason. I started getting really mad because he couldn't give me a reason, he just kept smirking at me. He did this kind of thing frequently. We were sitting in the living room and he silently got up and drove off somewhere came back, walked to the living room doorway, stared at me for 15 seconds and walked into my room. I hear a bunch of rustling, so I storm in there thinking he's doing something sketchy. He's gotten completely dressed into his sleep pants with a hand in his pocket that he wouldn't take out of his pocket and at this point I'm scared. I force my hand into his pocket and he pulls out a weapon. Fast forward again. I'm at my best friend Kayla's birthday party and everyone is camping in the backyard. Ernest hated Kayla because she was always a way out for me. In his perspective, she's got it in for us. I'm sweating just remembering this because it's probably one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. 
I had made it clear to Ernest at this point that we were not a thing, and that he needed to let go of the fantasy. I had a crush on a boy named John, and we slept in the same tent together. Morning comes, and I hear Ernest outside asking people if they knew where I was. Someone said that I was in the tent with John. I was scared. Immediately, I knew something bad was going to happen. The tent rips open. I don't have a shirt on, and he begins screaming as loudly as he can, cursing at us, and just being an absolute piece of filth, and then storms off after his fit. He goes to his car and calls me and tells me, get to the car now. Everyone there was freaked out, and Kayla advised me not to go to the car because she knew how scary he was as a person. I didn't want anyone to be uncomfortable, so I figured that if I went to the car I could ease everyone just a little bit, but he wasn't there. I went and as soon as the door closed, we sped off. Fast. Really fast. I look over at him, wide-eyed, and he is scream crying with absolutely no expression on his face. Tears streaming but emotionless. You were supposed to love me, is what he said over and over again. He starts speeding faster and said, If I can't have you, no one can. I'm actively having a straight-up panic attack in the passenger seat. I can't hear because my ears are ringing, and I can't see a thing. Meanwhile, Kayla has already called my mum and somehow my mum left the house fast enough to track us down in that PT cruiser. He parks at a church and my mum is watching us. Ernest has a box cutter at his side. I get a call from my mum. I can't remember what she said, but I knew it was something along the lines of, I'm going to slit your throat, to Ernest. He started coming to his senses. If I can even call it that. He drops me back off at Kayla's and tells me that he's going to end himself after he drops me off. Kayla and I were frantically trying to call his parents about a possible imminent attempt. However, they couldn't speak English. He called the police on himself because he thought he was going to harm himself or someone else. He was gone for a few weeks then came back. He was parked outside school waiting for me to come out. He runs up to me and I noticed that he had a plaid button-up shirt that was tucked into his pants, which was just extremely odd for me, and I knew immediately that this was a fake personality. He was speaking differently as well, almost like a few weeks had turned him into a saint. It wasn't long after that I had admitted myself to a mental institution because I just kept breaking down. Everyone in the groups told me to get rid of him, and I'd not realised how serious this was until I saw everyone's reaction to the stories. There are so many stories of this psycho, but I can't even express them all. I did get rid of him, I found new friends, and without them I don't know if I would have been able to overcome this. I haven't seen or spoken to him in three years, and hope to never see him again. I'm a 24 year old female, and this happened last year when I was visiting my mum. My neighbourhood is known for being safe, or at least that's what my family thought. We've got problems with neighbours on both sides of our house. We live in a small town that has been growing due to the university that was built here. My mum lives across the street from the uni as she teaches there. Our house has two floors and my room is on the second floor. The window is right on the front of our house, so you can see the street from it. Every night around midnight when I was going to sleep, I heard my dogs barking and growling. Whenever I went to the windows to see why are they barking, I couldn't see anything. There are a lot of trees and bushes in front of my house, so maybe that's what they were barking at, something hiding there. This went on for at least a week, and it was always at midnight. This night I was having trouble sleeping, so I was video chatting with my boyfriend at midnight. My dogs were barking like crazy. I was sitting in the front of my window and couldn't see anything unusual, but I felt the strange vibe like I was about to discover what was hiding on my front yard and scaring my dogs. I turn off the lights and stay still, watching the streets from a place that no one outside could see me from. My boyfriend was still chatting with me, saying that perhaps it was a fox or a raccoon, as there's a lot of wildlife near where my mum lives. I stayed there for a while. My boyfriend went to sleep, but I kept looking out the window. It was only 1.30 when I see something moving from the bushes. A man wearing all black crouched right beside them. My body froze and I didn't call my mum to see it. I've already told her about my dogs going crazy in our front yard at the same time every night, 
But like my boyfriend, she said it was an animal. So I was there looking at him, and he couldn't see me. He started moving, but still was bent over so no one could see him. But as I was on the second floor, I could see him just fine. He crawled with his back right next to our fence until he reached the neighbor's gate. Right inside that gate, his car was parked. What happened next was really fast. He lit up a Molotov cocktail and tossed it in the car. The car went up in flames like crazy, and I finally called my mum to see what was happening. He ran away like a feral cat so fast down the street, and my mum called the police and the fire department. When they got there, the man was long gone. The next day, my mum got a call from the police officer that came the night before, telling him that they arrested the man that did it. He was trying to convince his ex-wife, who was our neighbour, to get back at him. He said he would do the worst things to her if she didn't get back with him, and after that she moved out in a week. We never really spoke to her, so I don't know any more details. I'm glad he got arrested, and I'm sad that I only managed to do something after her car was set on fire. I am a 22-year-old female. I met this girl called Brittany in preschool. We were three and four respectively, with me being the older one. We became friends instantly. We had similar stories. Both of us had issues with our fathers and lived with our divorced mothers. She had a stepdad and three siblings, and one was from a previous marriage, and did not grow up with them and I just had my single mom and my little sister. Brittany and I were basically inseparable for several years. All through elementary school, we played every single day together, and had slumber parties, and even went to each other's birthday parties each year. It was like Katie and Sadie from Total Drama Island, almost exactly like them, and every bit as annoying. One constant problem I always had with her was that she was a compulsive liar, but I didn't even bother acknowledging it most of the time. I would only call her out when I felt like it was really necessary, because I didn't want to fight with her. This fact is important to know about her. It was a well-known fact by literally everyone in our school that we were best friends, because she would always flaunt me. Looking back now, it felt like I was a trophy for her, and she was showing me off to everyone else like they couldn't have me because I was hers. Everyone around me would tell me all the time how it was a little creepy. I disagreed because she never made me feel like I was in any danger or like she was in love with me. When we were alone, she was this pitiful little girl that had family problems and was depressed and self-harmed and did all these bad things to herself. I just wanted to make her happy and I did everything possible to make her happy every single day. I gave her my food, brought her food, took her places, let her come to my house and hang out with me. I was the best friend to her I possibly could be. She was always unhappy with it though. She would always make small snide remarks about me, just resent me in every way possible, even though I cared so deeply for her. She even said, and this is from her own mouth, that she was jealous of me, and she hated me sometimes because I was perfect to her. I told her how ridiculous that was. One of the biggest points of contention between us was the fact we have always had issues surrounding food, the exact opposite issues. She was overweight and overate, and I was underweight and malnourished. This is actually still true to this day for both of us, but I digress. She would complain almost daily about how ugly and fat and nobody liked her because of it. But it was almost like a performance because of how rehearsed and empty it was. It was almost routine for us to have these conversations, where I would build her up in every way possible and literally spend hours texting her about how amazing she was. And she would get angry with me because I wasn't agreeing with her and fought with me because I couldn't just let her be sad. She had friends aside from me, but she didn't care about them. She was focused on me completely. She would talk about how she was sucking out my soul all the time. Of course, she'd be passing it off as a joke, but the truth is she knew exactly what she was doing, because she was a completely 
different person when I wasn't around. I had other friends tell me that when I wasn't around, Brittany was not happy and bubbly, how she was with me most of the time, especially in front of a lot of the people that we knew, and was kind of putting on a performance for the crowd. Nor was she moody nor sad, which is how she often acted around me and alone. She was just mean. She was creepy. She would stare people down if they tried to walk up to me and talk to me, but she made sure I never saw that. She would tell other people how I was talking crap about them, but yet I never did. She loved to pick fights with me, and whenever she did, she would always go to one of our friends badmouthing me about it, telling them I was terrible for doing XYZ, and that she hated me and never wanted to see my ugly mug again. She was constantly berating me for something, even if it was something small like insulting what I was wearing that day, or observing out loud I had a very large zit on my face trying to embarrass me. Very childish stuff. This went on throughout high school. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The turning point in our relationship happened in 8th grade. This year was when she began losing her grip. She blamed it on the fact that she was not in the same pod, which is a group of classes and teachers, that I was in that year. She, in fact, made such a fuss about it that halfway through the year she claimed that she needed specifically to be in more classes with me because of her home life, and she told the school I was her only friend and that I could help. So the school switched her schedule around and put us in almost every single class together. One day, I was spending the night at her house, and she was showing me this role-playing game called Corpse Party. If you've not seen, read, or played it, it's a pretty cool game. However, that night turned into something completely abnormal from what we usually did. She was showing me the anime for Corpse Party, and getting to the scene where, spoiler alert, Naomi finds Seiko in the bathroom. Brittany got very excited at this part, and told me about how it's her favourite part of the whole story, because of the tragedy involved. You see, Naomi is possessed and blacks out, out of control and unaware of her actions, and the fact that Naomi and Seiko were best friends. When Brittany showed me this, she told me, I want to do this to you. For a bit of context, Seiko was actually found with a noose around her neck, in the bathroom, hanging. It was at this point that she said to me, I want to do this to you, too. She told me she wanted to end my life. At that moment I wasn't scared and didn't know what to say, but it wasn't because I thought my life was actually in danger. I was scared because I thought there was genuinely something wrong with my dear friend, and I wanted to help her. I spent that night listening to her vent, and unload everything she needed to, and comforted her, after she said that to me, because I saw it as a cry for help. That was the very first time I really felt off about her. Sure, she was annoying a lot of the time with her bratty tantrums and spats and fights over nothing, but those were all forgivable because I still loved her and didn't care. I wanted to be her friend, and be there for her even though she wasn't a very good friend to me. I innocently thought that she just didn't know what she was doing and didn't know how bad she was hurting me, so I just took it on the chin and didn't complain. The night after the whole corpse party incident, Brittany began hitting me. She would quite literally bonk me on the head or arm with her closed fist, basically punching me all the time. The teachers never said a word. When I told my mum about it, Though she was like, you're not hanging out with her anymore until she sorts herself out. I listened to her, not because she was mum and I did what I was told though. I was a sneaky little brat, and if I still wanted to talk to Brittany, I would have. But I was glad she said that, because that meant I didn't have to make that decision by myself. Brittany was so upset, but not in the way you'd expect. Since we were in almost every single class together, she was still around me every day. She fought with me all the time and said, we're not friends anymore, like a child, a lot. But this was different because I was actively ignoring her and not speaking to her at all. This lasted for around a month, 
every single day she would cycle between being absolutely furious and staring holes in the back of my head to trying to look really, really overly sad to the point where other people in class said something to her. She wasn't satisfied with the attention though. She wanted mine and made that obvious. One day after school, we're still not talking. I was in the car ride home with my mum and sister when I got a call. It was Brittany. I answered and she let me know that she had been admitted to a psychiatric ward. She acted like she was in jail the way she played up the theatrics, that being her speciality, being dramatic. And as a kid who's never been through anything like that, I believed every word she told me. So when she finally came back home, it was like a reunion between a military family. We ran up and hugged each other in slow motion like a lifetime movie. She apologized and I thought she meant it and we became friends again. However, our relationship was never quite the same after that. I had my guard up and no longer blindly believed everything she said. She'd been caught in numerous lies by me over the years, but I was just much more skeptical of her after this happened. Once we were in high school, we started to mature. I was less obtuse, naive and gullible. She was not much different though. She still pulled all the shots. However, in high school, Brittany and I were part of a large friend group of around 10 that hung out constantly during school. We all hung out as a large group. And so we even got to know each other really well. In fact, one of the subgroups for me was her, Evan and Adam. This is what we call our close knit. We were the four musketeers and hung out outside of school all the time. Other people saw how Brittany behaved and questioned it, especially to me. They would come to me when she wasn't glued to my hip and say, why do you put up with that? If she treated me that way, I wouldn't even be friends with her. I would just say that I'm her best friend and that's what friends do. I still didn't really question it, but I was starting to. Junior year was one of the hardest of my entire life. That year, my second dog, Sophie, was only six years old and passed away from lymphoma. It happened on Christmas Eve morning, 2014. My birthday came very soon after that. I'd been dating this guy for three years, starting in eighth grade, ironically, and literally the day after my birthday party, he dumped me for another girl, right after my dog died because I wouldn't sleep with him. This guy had pursued me for over a year because I didn't even like him. And when I finally did date him, I fell for him and his stupid ass. And he did that to me. As well as a ton of other stuff, but that's a whole nother story in itself. Safe to say I was extremely depressed after all this happened and hardly ate anything for two whole weeks. I cried in class multiple times. I don't do that stuff, especially when I was younger because I always thought it was a sign of weakness to act like that in front of people. The odd thing is, this is when Brittany and I got a little closer again. She was actually a little nicer to me and didn't rag on nearly as hard as usual. I thought I was finally getting the friend I missed back and I was so happy. At this time, we made a pact that if we were still single at 35, we'd just marry each other. We acted like real friends again. However, after nine months, I started dating someone that we'd known since kindergarten. One of the boys that were part of our close knit, Evan. Brittany was not happy about this. She told me I completely ruined the whole friend group and that I was so selfish and that I didn't care about her. This guy had been in love with me since we met. We dated once in seventh grade and he was the nicest guy I'd ever met. But I was actually scared of a healthy relationship, so I didn't stay with him. I didn't know that's why I broke up with him at the time. I just thought I didn't like him. But the fact of the matter is that if I had never had someone be nice to me the way he was, and it make me uncomfortable, not that it was his fault, but because of what all my other relationships looked like. Okay, we get it. I have daddy issues. Brittany even got Adam to side with him. They both started complaining that we were ruining the friendship group and ruining our relationships with everything else. But everyone else was happy for us. They were the only ones complaining. And actually, I only personally heard Adam complain about it very rarely. But Brittany would complain for him all the time. 
She would claim he said something about it today and that she agreed, but he wouldn't say it to me. This makes me think that he never really cared about it as much as she did, or as much as she was trying to make out like he did. And it was an excuse to keep pushing the issue because it wasn't just her complaining about it. Whatever. Evan and I are still dating to this day, and have been for almost five years now, and he's the best thing that ever happened to me. But this story isn't about him. The next big incident that really made me question Brittany's motives happened in college. The four of us in the close-knit group went to four different colleges, and most other people from our big group just stopped talking to each other. That's commonplace. Not everyone stays friends with the same people that they were friends with in high school. Everyone starts to drift apart a little, especially because most of us were busy with college. Adam and I both picked very different majors, architecture and nursing respectively. So we barely had time to breathe, let alone talk to people. Brittany hated it. She would complain all the time and literally beg me to speak to her when I physically couldn't. And she did not give a single crap about any of my excuses. She would just say that if I'm a real friend, I'll make time for her. Evan got it. We barely got to see each other and we still made it work. As time progressed, I realized that I was not as put together as I thought. I had always scraped by on the bare minimum, but I thought it was just because I was simply lazy. When I got to college, I put my ass into overdrive and worked hard. I started to figure out that I actually was suffering from a mental illness. I was diagnosed with PTSD and GHD, Generalized Anxiety Disorder, and MDD, Major Depressive Disorder. This is when I actually started to care about taking care of myself and stopped letting people walk all over me. Brittany didn't like that. And it was especially ironic because she had always bragged to me about how much worse her life was and how I couldn't possibly understand her because I didn't even have mental illness or health issues or family problems. And I didn't have it half as bad as her. Her saying these things to me, constantly growing up, made me believe it. I blatantly ignored all of my issues and simply pretended it wasn't happening. I repressed traumatic memories and just kept trucking. Brittany actually knew this because she reminded me of a specific trauma I'd forgotten for five years. But somewhere deep down that I didn't want to look at, I knew I was depressed. I knew there was something wrong, but I wanted so badly for it not to be true that I pretended I wasn't for years. Okay, now on to what Brittany did in college. She dropped out of college during the second semester of freshman year. Sophomore year, she was in New York babysitting her cousin for her aunt. Now, before I get to the incident, I just want to mention that New York City was Britney's favorite place in the whole world. She's a musical theater geek, a Broadway superfan, and she talked about wanting to be there all the time, so this was the perfect opportunity for her. Halfway through sophomore year, it was my birthday. I was turning 20. Britney had always been front and center at my birthday parties when we grew up. She would make it her own itinerary and would always find a reason for me to need to be with her and comfort her privately upstairs in my bedroom. It was really just a ploy to be alone with me, but we'll get there. My 20th birthday was the very first party I'd had since I met her where she wasn't attending. That's 16 birthday parties for those of you keeping score. I was having a great time. I hated to admit it then, but I felt really free and unrestricted, like I could finally do what I wanted instead of what she wanted me to do. I was about to open my birthday presents when I received a phone call from Brittany. I excused myself and answered. Hello? I have some good news, I'm... Oh, and bad news. I'm coming home. Oh, really? When? They're sorting it out right now. And what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is the reason I'm coming back. What happened? Well, I may have swallowed a whole bottle of pills and got caught throwing them up by my little cousin. Why did you do that? What happened? Nothing happened. It was literally just a joke. I wasn't even planning on actually going through with anything at all. I didn't even want to kill myself. I was just bored and was going to take them all and throw up. Why would you do that? Well, I hate it here. Brittany, you're living your dream. But I miss you, so I wanted to come home. 
I offered weak condolences, saying I'm sorry that happened to her and saying I'm there for her and if she needed to talk to me she could text me and I hung up. I told my mum about it and she agreed that that was really suspicious. It just didn't make any sense from any angle. She'd been depressed for years, she'd self-harmed and done things like that before and never been caught, ever. It struck us as odd, even for her. After that happened, I really didn't hang out with Brittany very often. I actually started connecting more with another friend, Layla, from our high school group, that went to college with Evan. Evan, Lila and I became very close during college. Brittany started to get very jealous of that. Right before my 21st birthday, she began texting me, wanting to ask about my plans, initiating the conversation by showing me a picture from our fifth grade talent show and her recent car crash injuries for sympathy. Then she started asking if I'd been seeing Layla more often Then I saw her. At this point in our relationship, I was trying my best to still be nice to her, but I was so beyond sick of her bull. I actively started ignoring her, then avoiding her when I could. So I didn't try to hide the fact that I was hanging out with my friend because there was nothing wrong with it and I had no reason to be ashamed of it. Brittany was saying things like, when you're free, you don't even think about hitting me up to hang out. You text her and you don't even think of me. It's like pulling teeth, just trying to get your attention. Really possessive stuff. I was just like, yeah, I hang out with her and I hang out with you too, so be happy about it. I can do what I want, I'm an adult, and will hang out with whoever I want. She then went on to say, yeah, I guess we've just really drifted apart. And I was like, yep, we sure have. We aren't close anymore. She continued trying to guilt me into saying something nice to her to make her feel better, but I just stopped replying. I was sick of the games. Not long before that text conversation, Brittany had actually started working at the same place as Layla. Layla was a hairdressing student at his local salon, and Brittany started as a secretary at the front. The management had to literally explain to Brittany that even though she and Lila were friends, she couldn't go to the back and hover around her all day. She was trying to get close to Layla, as she was with me. Trying to become a closer friend, so Layla would be more inclined to do what she wanted. Layla knew this though, and didn't fall for it. She told me about it and we bonded over how Brittany was being weird to both of us. Then, on my 21st birthday, we of course got drunk. I was there with Evan, Lila, her boyfriend at the time, and some other friends. We were just talking and somehow Brittany came up. After I got to college, I started to realize that the way she behaved was not normal for friends and I didn't feel guilty telling people about it. Layla shared with me that she actually had something to tell me about Brittany. I was caught off guard, but it was expecting another crazy work story. No. Layla told me that she and many others from our high school friend group had actually seen a different side of her. When I wasn't around, she changed. Layla described how Brittany's face would fall flat and emotionless and she would say horrible things and then she'd snap back like it never happened. Layla warned me she was about to tell me a lot and I was like, come on, I've dealt with the worst from her already. She shook her head. She proceeded to tell me how Brittany had said multiple times over the course of high school that she was definitely in love with me. Apparently, she was not the same Christian modest girl I knew. And when I wasn't there, she would make violent and explicit comments about how she wanted to violate me and my body and end me. She talked about how we were going to be together no matter what, that if she couldn't have me, no one will. She told everyone that if I was with someone else by the time we turned 35, she would just have to take care of them, so I would be free. I was stunned, but that wasn't everything. She proceeded to inform me that Brittany had recently, since they started working together at the salon, devised a plot to frame Evan for cheating on me by tricking him into a situation where another girl kisses him and she gets it on camera. She told Layla about the plan because she wanted Layla to help her. Layla said, I'm not about to ruin a happy relationship for no reason, and I'm not helping you do that. But Brittany didn't do that. There was a reason Layla even told me this in the first place. 
because Brittany was still doing it years later. This was the final straw for me. I resolved myself to the fact that Brittany was not a friend to me and was actually a danger to me. Someone who I had grown up with, literally done everything for, for nearly two decades. Almost my whole life in childhood. Someone who I trusted and did everything to please and take care of and make happy. Hell, we held hands as we walked up to the auditorium to get our diplomas when we graduated high school. That is how public our friendship was. We literally made sure everyone knew that we were best friends. I decided that I had to cut her off once and for all. So what I decided to do was hang out with her one last time, have a final good memory with her, and then talk to her alone and confront her. Evan was there with me as I planned this out, and he was scared for my safety. I decided to take her to the local park, as even at night it's heavily patrolled by police and well lit. I also had my mace, as well as a weapon on me. My heart was pounding the entire time from the second I saw her that night, and I felt sick to my stomach. It was like being a very small child and realizing for the very first time that the Easter Bunny at the mall was just some guy in a suit. It was like my whole life was a lie. I drove her out to the park and we sang musical theater songs together like we always did. And then I finally mustered up the courage to say it. I confronted her about all the stuff she'd done to me over the years, everything. She apologized for the majority of it because she knew she was mean to me. She knew she was abusing me. She admitted so much, saying from her own words that nobody deserved to go through what she put me through. Then, I finally brought up the allegations of the horrible thing she was saying and plotting behind my back. She acted like she was shocked. And I know this girl very well, and can tell when she's lying because I saw it so often while growing up. So I could tell it was insincere. She's normally very good at manipulating people and acting out her own part in whatever situation she's in. But when I brought this up, it caught her off guard. She hesitated. She'd never done that before. She then denied it, explaining that no one likes her and people make up lies about her all the time. I had, of course, heard that excuse before and didn't buy it. I told her I knew no one was making this up and that I wanted her to admit it. She just got this scowl on her face and said, You know what? I knew you were going to do something like this tonight. I knew you just didn't want to see me. I knew you had another reason. I stopped liking you a couple of years ago. Every time you'd message me, I'd go through, ugh, what does this girl want? I hate her. I realized I wasn't going to get anywhere with her. She was never going to admit the truth to me. So I said, fine, you don't have to tell me, but I know the truth now. I'm taking you home. Don't ever contact me again. We rode home together in silence. I didn't look at her once. I was scared to. I had my mace and my weapon in my purse right at my feet if she tried anything, and I was shaking like a leaf the entire ride. I finally dropped her off and she got out, slammed the door and walked away. Now something I need to tell you. I've written about this story before on another website called Wattpad, anonymously hiding her info, and never revealed her identity once. However, a few months after I cut her off, she found out that I'd put a link to that Wattpad story on my Tumblr page. She then decided to go on a social media rampage, publicly calling me a liar and saying that I was slandering her name all over the internet. She did this probably because she thought I wouldn't find out, but other people I know were still connected to her on social media. She blocked me on everything after I cut her off, so they'd saw what she was doing and told me. I then decided that I'd had enough. I didn't talk to anyone about Brittany except for Layla and Evan because I didn't want to be seen as petty and still worried about high school drama. But honestly, this was on a whole level from that. After she started calling me out by name on her pages, I fought back. This is when I decided to make a YouTube video about it and I announced to everyone on all my platforms that if they knew both of us in high school and wanted to know what happened to watch it. Brittany and her family tried to stop me from making the video at all, messaging me on everything, talking about how it'll ruin my chances of getting a job and how I'll look really bad and everyone already knew what happened and that I'm beating a dead horse. When, as I previously mentioned, I literally didn't tell anyone about it. I just ignored them. They even called my mum and she tried to stop me, 
but I ignored that too, because I'd been bottling everything up for my whole life and I was sick of it, and I finally wanted to tell my story. It's been over a year since I cut her off now. I still think about it a lot, because I still suffer from many issues in communication and my own identity because of it. I remade the YouTube video as it still bothered me. A hell, I've even made a bunch of TikToks about the story and it still haunts me. So I'm praying to whatever the hell is listening out there, that this will be the last time I think about this whole thing. I hope it helps me process it, find peace and move on. My life is way better now. Evan and I are going strong, Layla is my real best friend, and she probably saved my life. Brittany, I never want to see you again. Not even in my nightmares. My ex JJ was a creep. I was with him for 19 months and this happened around two months into the relationship. Just as he was starting to get controlling and it terrified me. It was 2am and I was in bed. I have super bad insomnia so I was just listening to YouTube and scrolling through Reddit. Not expecting to sleep for at least a few hours when I heard a tap on my window. I assumed it was my cat so I called her name because she always meowed when she heard her name but it was silent, and then more tapping. I turned the app right down and called my cat again, and I heard her meow in the bathroom and panicked. It wasn't her outside my window. Outside my window was the roof of an extension that was built. It slopes up to my window and can easily be climbed onto via my neighbor's woodshed. At that point I knew there was something out there, but I was too scared to look. I sent JJ a message, but he was asleep, so it sent but didn't deliver. The tapping kept happening. Roughly every 20 seconds there would be a tap and then silence. It carried on for 45 minutes while I lay in bed just listening. I felt like I got stuck in bed, like if I came out from under the quilt then they would somehow get me. After an hour, I realized it all stopped completely. I pulled myself down from bed and went to my kitchen where I could see the roof and saw a pair of legs dangling over the edge illuminated by a torch. I decided to give up with my room and slept on the sofa with my cat that night. At least whoever's in there wouldn't know I was there. Next thing I know I'm waking up to my alarm. I go to turn it off and notice that I have snapshots from JJ which is odd but not unheard of. They're from around 3.30am, so probably just after I fell asleep. I open the snaps and my stomach dropped. It was a photo of my bedroom window from the outside, then one of legs dangling into my garden and then one of me sleeping on the sofa, taken through the kitchen window. I messaged him asking him what the hell he was doing, and I got a reply saying he'd come to check on me and chased a guy off my house. At that point he convinced me he could do no wrong, and if I opposed him I was scared about what might happen so I just left it at that. From then on, it happened a few more times and every time I tried to ignore it, but with the joy of hindsight I know I shouldn't have. I should have told someone or broken up with him but I was too scared of what he might do. I've been considering writing a book about all the travesties he's committed. In any case, I'm glad we separated and I hope to never see him again. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I do hope you enjoyed this video. My voice has gone really raspy now. It actually hurts a little bit to talk. Um, well, I'm going to update you on the medical situation. Went in with the doctor today, and he told me that my tests were fine. But he doesn't know what's wrong with me. So we're going to be doing some further testing, yeah, to try and determine the cause of this thing that's going on. Which is, you know, a bit meh. Well, I suppose at least it's not life-threatening, apparently. But yeah, we're going to be doing further tests, and I'll update you if anything bad or good happens. Alright then guys, well I think I'd like to thank all my lovely patrons and members, whose names are on screen if you want to join. You can probably guess what you need to do, and I really would appreciate it. I'm going to go now, my voice is almost completely destroyed. <laughs> Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.